Good evening. Welcome to the Art Song Society performance of Speakeasy or Not at All. My name is Melanie Klein and I'm on the board of directors for the Art Song Society. I love art song because it connects me to beauty, to a different variety of live music, and to the incredible local musicians. We are excited that you have joined us to learn about art song during the 1920s composed by women. The Art Song Society aims to unite audiences through the exploration of history and culture through art song. First and foremost, we want to thank the Tennessee Arts Commission for partially funding this concert. This grant has allowed us to record and stream the entire season for free to you and for your communities. Now, part of the grant requires that funding be matched. We humbly ask you to consider donating so that we can match the funds granted to us by the Tennessee Arts Commission. A link to giving is in the description below, which will take you to our Facebook page where you can donate. Additionally, we would like to thank Belmont Mansion for opening this space to our performers tonight. This space where I am standing was built in 1859, and it is in a space such as this that art song is to be performed. Finally, the Art Song Society wants to know what you think and what piques your interest. There is a survey box below. Would you please click and spend just five minutes completing the survey? And without further ado, will you please enjoy this concert from the comfort and safety of your own home? Oh, and if you haven't poured yourself a glass of wine yet, please do so and access the program that can be found on the Facebook page. And now, this is Speakeasy or Not at All. Many barriers stood in the way of women composers. There were growing opportunities for them in education and performance. Many women composers began a path to music and recognition by attending conservatories and studying internationally. Maude Valerie White was one such composer. She was born in 1855 and died in 1937. She was a French-born English composer and writer most known for her abilities as a gifted songwriter. She wrote some 200 songs and cultivated the genre of the Victorian drawing room ballad. White decided on a career in music at an early age, but her mother did not approve of the idea. In 1876, she was able to finally convince her mother to let her enter the Royal Academy of Music. But her mother's hesitancy and prejudice was a common view during this time. The main concern of her mother and her mother's friends was that her entering the academy could negatively impact Maud's social class, and she might be exposed to, quote, appalling dangers, end quote, such as the daughters of tradespeople. So it was extremely important who you were associated with and who you were seen with. Fortunately, Mrs. White overcame these societal views. And aside from a good education, a good musical education, winning competitions and earning prominent scholarships were other means of gaining recognition. In 1879, Maude Valerie White became the first woman to win the Mendelssohn Scholarship, a testament of her skill. Unfortunately, she was forced to resign the scholarship two years later due to poor health. She managed to complete her musical education in 1883 in Vienna, but recurrent illness once again forced her to travel in search of more suitable climates for her health. She used this to her advantage though, and she became an extremely skilled linguist, and she was able to translate many of her own song texts and books. White was fluent in French, German, Italian, Spanish, and English, and she would choose poems in these various languages to set to music. Maud Valerie White worked to support her career, much like many other women composers during the time. She gave piano lessons and played professionally at musical parties, and she would use these opportunities to promote her own compositions, often teaching her pieces to her students and performing her own works at various galas and soirees. 
She is closely associated with the Victorian drawing room ballad genre that dominated the English vocal scene during the height of her career, which would be around the 1880s and 1890s. Though the genre existed before her, she helped to elevate the artistic standard of the genre through the practice of carefully choosing the text for each composition and adapting her own style to better capture the essence of the text's meaning. Cravid Age and Youth is no exception, and she composed the piece around 1896. The poem is thought to be a work of William Shakespeare, and it comes from a collection of 20 poems titled The Passionate Pilgrim. Maud Valerie White's setting of the text captures all the personality and charm of the original poem. The shifts in mood and tonality perfectly reflect the singer's growing frustration with the differences between the old and the young. It is full of character and truly displays White's understanding of the love of her love of literature. As you listen to the piece, pay close attention to the different moods assigned to certain words and phrases, and hear how perfectly the youthful and humorous text has been translated into music. towards the United States of America, another woman composer that gained recognition around the turn of the century and well into the 20s was Amy Marcy Beach. She was born in 1867 and died in 1944. Beach was an American composer and most notably the first American woman to succeed as a composer of large scale art music. During her lifetime, she was celebrated as the foremost composer of the United States. At the time of her death, she had composed more than 300 musical works. Some women faced difficulties trying to publish their compositions, often turning to self-publication or publishing under a male name just to get their music out into the world. But Beach had no such issue. With very few exceptions, all of her compositions were published. This was a triumph for Beach. But it's important to note that this was a situation that was basically unheard of at the time. So she was extremely lucky and talented to be able to achieve this. She was something of a musical prodigy. She was memorizing songs and improvising harmonies before she had turned three years old. Her mother began teaching her to play piano at the age of six. And by the age of seven, she was playing Handel, Beethoven, and Chopin in her recitals. When she was 12, her parents were told that they could enter her into a European conservatory, but they declined. Instead, they opted to have her uh, train with local private instructors. Because of this, Amy Beach was largely self-taught. She only received one year of formal training in composition, but obviously this didn't hold her back in any significant way. She had a successful debut in 1883 and married Dr. Beach two years later. At the time of their wedding, she was 19 and he was more than twice her age. 
Her husband, like many other husbands during the time, preferred her to be a wife rather than a concert pianist. So, in accordance with his wishes, she curtailed her public performances to only one public recital a year. She instead turned her focus towards composition, which he did encourage. Um, but again, we see an example of women musicians being limited by the societal norms of the time. Maud White's mother wanted her to perhaps not pursue music, and uh, Beach's husband wanted her to not be a performer. Her career, however, changed pretty significantly after her husband's death in 1910. She traveled to Europe and began promoting herself as a performer and a composer. She no longer had anybody holding her back from what she wanted to do. She built up her reputation and was met with favorable reviews. She returned to the States at the outbreak of World War I and continued to tour and give concerts. Though Beach saw great success throughout her career, she was always aware that there were other women that were not so lucky. Later in life, she would use her status as Dean of American Women Composers to further the careers of many young musicians that were not so lucky. She also served as a leader of several organizations, including President of the Society of American Women Composers. Beach's Three Browning Songs has proven to be one of her most popular vocal compositions. She composed the work between 1899 and 1900 and dedicated the set to the Browning Society of Boston. The first song, The Years of the Spring, is arguably the most popular out of the three. Astonishingly, Beach composed this piece in her head while she was on a train. The driving triplet rhythms in the piano are not unlike the persistent rhythm of train wheels moving down the track. The song is often sung last when the set is performed, but not always. All Love But A Day features another dramatic ending. The beautifully shaped vocal phrases gradually build in intensity as the song progresses. Finally, there is I Send My Heart Up To Thee. This song is possibly the most intricate, and it features fluid modulation and emphasizes the varying emotions in the text. As you listen to the set, hear how each piece builds to a dramatic climax and listen for the driving locomotive rhythms in the years at the spring.
This next composer contrasts greatly with Amy Beach. While Beach saw immediate success, composed hundreds of songs, and had little difficulty getting her works published, Alma Mahler had a tumultuous life filled with controversy and wrote very few compositions. Alma Maria Mahler was born in 1879 and died in 1964, and she was an Austrian composer. She began composing at the age of nine and later began studying music and composition privately, much like Beach. In 1901, however, she met Gustav Mahler, who was 41 at the time, and the two became engaged. Very similar to Dr. Beach, though on a much more extreme level, Gustav wanted to limit Alma's musical output. He wrote her a lengthy letter after they were engaged, explaining how she should abandon all of her compositional aspirations and to live for his music alone. He believed that composer couples such as Robert and Clara Schumann were, quote, ridiculous, end quote, and quote, degrading, end quote, and insisted that she stop composing. She complied, but needless to say, their marriage was complex and unfortunately often unhappy. Alma's inability to compose, coupled with the untimely death of their daughter, Anna, is perhaps the reason why she began an affair with Walter Gropius. In an effort to repair their marriage, though, Gustav Mahler selected five of Alma's songs and insisted that she polish them and prepare them for publication. So clearly he knew that composing music was something very important to her. So it's fortunate that he helped her get these songs published, but it's very frustrating that he prevented her from doing so earlier. But thus, Fünf Lieder was published in 1910, a set of five songs. Gustav Mahler died in 1911, and by 1915, she married Walter Gropius. In that same year, she published her second set of songs, Fear Leader. Uh, Gropius served as an officer during World War I, and his time away put strain on their marriage and Alma started another affair. Um, they eventually would divorce in 1920. Sure, her affair was with Franz Werfel, and she would end up marrying him in 1929. But a few years before, she published her third set of songs, Fünfke Song, in 1924. Uh, together, her and Berfel fled from the Nazis in the 1930s and settled in America in the 1940s, where she lived a rather, a rather high-profile lifestyle. But she did not compose or publish any more music during her lifetime. Her song, Ich Wandel unter Blumen, was published in 1910 as a part of the Fünf Lieder set that Gustav helped her to publish. Uh, this song in particular is a bit more conventional than the first three songs in the set, and it's possible that she composed it before she began her formal private instruction, but this is just speculation. As a whole, her compositions are very dramatic and chromatic, and they display a careful sensitivity towards the poetry. We can only wonder what kind of composer Alma would have become had she been allowed to develop her compositional abilities to their fullest extent. When you listen to Ich Wandel unter Blumen, uh, play, pay close attention to the dense chromatic harmonies and consider how limited she was in her formal training, yet she was still able to compose a, pe a piece such as this. Oh. 
the last composer I will be discussing stands apart from the rest because she technically never made it to the 1920s, but her talent and overall impact make her more than worthy of being a part of this lecture recital. Lily Boulanger was born in 1893 and died in 1918, and she was a French composer. It is nearly impossible to discuss Lily without also mentioning her sister, Nadia. Nadia and Lily Boulanger made a notable impact on classical music of the 20th century. Lily is most remembered for her compositions, while Nadia, though a composer as well, is more likely to be remembered for her numerous students, many of which became leading composers of the 20th century, such as Aaron Copland. Due to Lily's untimely death at the age of 24, Nadia remains better known out of the two sisters, but this in no way diminishes the importance of Lily's contributions to music as a whole. Nadia and Lily come from a cultured musical family. Both their father and grandfather taught at the Paris Conservatoire, and their mother had been a professional singer. Her father even won the Prix de Rome in 1835 and saw some success as a composer of operas. Additionally, Gabriel Faure was a friend of the family and would occasionally accompany Lily on the piano as she sang. Lily was fortunate to come from a skilled musical family, but she, much like Maud White, was, uh, she was plagued by poor health. Lily developed bronchial pneumonia in 1895, and she was able to survive the illness, but it left her immune system permanently damaged and she would become prey to Crohn's disease throughout her life. Due to her poor health, Lily was only able to sporadically work, and she relied very heavily on her mother and her sister to help her and protect her. Both Nadia and Lily would follow their father's footsteps and enter the Prix de Rome, a French scholarship for art students. Nadia entered the competition in 1906 and 1907, but it wouldn't be until 1908 that she would play significantly. Lily Boulanger, who entered the conservatoire in 1912, would enter the Prix de Rome just a year and a half later in July of 1913, and she became the first woman to be awarded the Prix de Rome. She was only 19 years, at the 19 years old at the time. Uh, and as a testament to the closeness between her and her sister, she dedicated her winning cantata to Nadia instead of her composition teacher, which was tradition. Some attention should be given to the gender and what role it may or may not have played in both sisters' success. Um, even though they were women and that typically gets in the way of, of being able to find success as a composer, they were very fortunate to have an exceptionally musical family with connections. And so that granted them educational opportunities that were normally closed off to other women. Um, but despite this privileged upbringing, they still experienced some struggle uh, getting into the professional musical world after they finished their education. Nadia, out of the two, Nadia definitely felt that struggle a little bit more. She never won the Prix de Rome, so she didn't have that immediate recognition to back her up, so she had to constantly teach and work to build up her reputation. Lily's approach to her career can be viewed as outwardly a bit more professional, and she saw a quicker rise to notoriety. There's a little bit of irony in Lily's immediate success, though. Nadia was the eldest, and she was always trained to be the, the gifted musical child with a successful career, and she studied her whole life and tried for the Prix de Rome, and she never won it. Lily acquired the technical knowledge in just a few years, tried for the Prix de Rome, and won it the first time. You can, you can only wonder if there was some animosity between the sisters, but I like to think that there wasn't. Unfortunately, a few years after the launch of Lily's career, she would inevitably pass away in 1918. She worked on her music up until the very end of her life. The last composition she worked on was Pie Jesu, which was for voice, harp, organ, and string quartet. She was in such poor health as she composed this piece that she had to dictate the music note by note to her sister. Despite Lily's short life, she was able to accomplish a great deal musically. 
and it is evident that her harmonic language is deeply influenced by the Impressionist school. Lily Boulanger wrote primarily choral music, and much of her output consists of large choral and orchestral works, but she also composed instrumental works as well as works for voice and piano. Unfortunately, much of her music has been lost or destroyed and some of it is incomplete due to her dying at such a young age. One of her better known compositions that's still in existence is Reflex. Reflex is an art song composed for piano and voice in 1911. The text can be found in Matulink's collection of poems titled Sershad. Throughout the piece, Lily once again demonstrates her musical prowess by blending a lyric vocal line with both varied rhythmic patterns and sophisticated harmonic materials. As you listen to the piece, notice how she weaves those three components into a musical texture that perfectly captures the melancholy tone of Matterlink's reflective text. All four of these women are extremely different. Maud Valerie White faced some opposition from her mother, but ultimately she was a single woman with complete professional training. Amy Beach was mostly self-taught, and while her career as a performer was temporarily stunted, her ability as a composer was always encouraged. Alma Mahler had limited training, and her musical career was completely put on hold by her first husband and Lily Boulanger was supported by her family throughout her life, but ultimately restricted by her health. Their success is completely reliant on either the support they received from their family or the independence they were able to gain from their family. Both Beach and Mahler found the most success once they were no longer beholden to the restrictions of their husbands. White eventually received the support that she needed to pursue her musical ambitions. Um, but for the vast majority of her life, 
She was independent and could do what she wanted without anything standing in her way. Lily Boulanger is the only woman out of these four to have consistently received encouragement and support from her family, so she didn't need the independence that the other women needed for, for them to find success. These women were the lucky ones. Their families had the money or the connections to give them some sort of musical education to jumpstart that career path into music. But there were countless others that did not have these luxuries. Ultimately, pursuing a career in music during the 20s was a constant uphill battle. You had to repeatedly work to pursue your passion, whether that be constantly composing when you don't have the opportunity to perform, or teaching and playing as often as possible to build your reputation. And I think many musicians today can still relate to that quite a lot. Though some women composers were more successful than others during this time, it is up to us as teachers, performers, and listeners to remember all of them and make sure that their compositions and their achievements are not forgotten. Thank you for joining us this evening. We hope that you have learned something about art song during the 1920s and feel inspired to learn more about art song. Thank you to the Tennessee Arts Commission and to the Belmont Mansion. If you feel inclined to donate, please click on the link below and take five minutes to complete the survey, which is also linked below. Finally, thank you for supporting the performing arts during COVID. Artists are doing all they can to reimagine various art forms during this time. And we are thrilled that you have joined us in that adventure this season. Have a safe and enjoyable summer.